Episode 69 was with Joshua Spears. Adam was able to talk to him on the phone, and today we are celebrating his debut EP, Human Now, and also check out his new music video, Can I Fall in Love with a Broken Heart? If you are listening after today, it was released on May 8th, 2020. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Bringing It Backwards and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bringing Back Pod. Follow us, please. We're Bringing It Backwards with Joshua Spears. Hey, Adam. Hey, Joshua. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? I am great. Thanks for uh, chatting with me today. I really appreciate it. Of course. Of course. I'm thrilled to do it. (laughs) <laughs> right on. I'm not sure how familiar you are with our podcast, but it's all about your uh, journey in the music industry and how you got to uh, where you are today. Yeah, I'm actually I'm a fan. I loved the one you guys did with Ethan Greska. Uh, that was a great conversation. Oh, awesome. Thank you for checking that out. That's awesome. I really appreciate it. Of course. Cool, man. Well, so uh, tell me a little bit about where you grew up. I grew up in Middletown, Delaware, for the most part, um, which is kind of out in like farm country in, in Delaware. Um, both of my parents were English teachers oh, wow. and actually both of my grandmothers were English teachers too. So a lot of books. <laughs> right. <in> yeah. Family. <laughs> um, and all, pretty much all the men on my dad's side back a couple of generations were all Presbyterian ministers, um, too. Oh, wow. And there was a very, there was a very like thin blurred line between what a religious text was and what a a book that was just worshipped as if it was religion sure um they were they were both uh held in such high regard yeah you obviously were 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 brought up with a lot of books and 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 that type of thing so that probably <laughs> spilled into a little bit into your uh your songwriting and your lyrics and stuff it did it definitely did. Yeah. I, when I went to college, um, I really tried to, I tried to rebel against that and was like, I'm, I'm never going to be, I'm not going to be an English major. I'm not going <laughs> to do what they did. And of course I was an English major, um, with a focus in poetry, but that was the best. That was, I mean, it was just the best songwriters education. Um, and having to, workshop your poems in front of a class of you know 15 of your peers um and we had there was a rule for my for the poetry workshops where you would read your poem to the class and then you weren't allowed to say anything for the rest of the discussion so you just had to hear everyone else misinterpret things or misunderstand a line or get something wrong and have to like burn in that feeling of frustration that it wasn't, your idea wasn't clear enough or that you could have said it in a sharper or simpler way. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was, I think back on that time, I'm so thankful for that experience to be comfortable with sharing ideas that are really precious and fragile in that editing first draft state. Um, and then just learning how to learning how to edit. I mean, that's a really cool exercise. I've never heard of that before, but you're almost getting like feedback in real time, but mm-hmm. you're not allowed to it's almost like you're looking in on like a like a like a workshop or something or like a focus group. Like a focus group, yeah, exactly. It's it's really, really good to do because I think that one of the best things that a reader can give you one of the best gifts is for them to say, this is where you lost me. This is where I kind of got distracted or my brain wandered. Um, And as a writer, it's really hard to predict those moments because when you're writing it, you're saying, of course, they're going to make the connection that what I'm saying is the gravestones in the backyard. But what I'm really talking about is the death of my former self that I've given up in this relationship um, and no one else is going to make that connection unless it's really clear, mm-hmm. um, to them. And so learning how to do that. And I think getting that experience in the workshops allowed me to just be a better editor of my own work and anticipate, you know, this could be clearer, this could be sharper. Um, this could just be simpler. I could say this more directly, things like that. In the beginning, was that kind of hard to hear? Like did, or did you already have kind of thick skin at that point? 
No, I had I had the thinnest skin. Yeah, it always felt like a personal attack whenever anyone said anything bad about my poems. Um, but I was really committed to learning and getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do think creativity is something that you get better at. It's not just you know this God given gift that shows up on your doorstep when you're a baby. Um, <laughs> totally. It's it's really something you can get better at, and you can hone the craft and you can practice it and um and you can continue to find ways to take an idea that comes out of nowhere um that's like the divine moment that it just shows up but you can take that idea and get better at working it into the best final product Mm -hmm. do you still do that today with your with your lyrics and stuff do you like run them by people or workshop them kind of i do yeah, one of my majors, or sorry, one of my managers was, we had the kind of bizarrely similar trajectory. He um, was an English major in college, got his graduate degree in poetry, um, started managing musicians, and then um, kind of took a break and got really involved in ceramics, um, which is very similar to what I did. I, I completely quit music for about a year and a half and was an apprentice to a potter in the woods of Massachusetts. Um, oh, so wow. I, I show him my, my lyrics. Um, I send my manager, my lyrics, and we kind of go back and forth. Um, and I love that, that process. Um, I do it with my, with the songs in general too, like from when they're first written, um, to the kind of first demo. And then I did like a week of pre-production before we went up to this studio outside of San Francisco to record all the songs. And each time just like kind of kept ripping the songs open and stitching them back together. Um, and I, I think it's really important to turn over every stone and every possible way of putting a song together. Um, because you're going to, as emotionally exhausting as that is and scary as that is, you're going to find something that you wouldn't have first thought of. And I think the scariest part is you're like, you feel like, oh, is this really me though? Is this really like what, is this true to, to my like most uh, spontaneous self or am I trying to like manufacture something? Um, but you just have to keep, keep going and see it through. Yeah. Yeah. I could see how that would be um, definitely a thought because you've already written out what you thought would be perfect. Like in the first draft, like, okay, yep. this is what I'm feeling exactly. right now. And then you're sending it to other people and they're giving you feedback. And then it's like, well, did this yeah. just turn into something that it wasn't originally (laughs) right is it even mine anymore like is it even me anymore and i think that's you know you have to have a strong rudder you have to keep your your course true and you have to do the work as an artist to be able to say you know this is me or this isn't me um and sometimes you go you go too far and you have to walk it back of you've you've taken too much input um, from people and it, it doesn't feel like you anymore. And that's really scary too, to have an idea that's really far along and say, you know, I, I, I really actually think that first idea was better. Um, and I feel that's, that's work that in order to be able to make those decisions, it's like, you have to be, I mean, there's so much emotional work that goes into that outside of songwriting. Um, of just kind of taking care of yourself so that you do trust yourself. Yeah. And you'd have to trust whoever you're working with, like your manager. Like what if he was giving you (laughs) terrible information that you just thought was great. And then he just screwed up your whole song. And that's something I've gotten really lucky with growing up on the campus of a school with, with my parents. And um, I was always surrounded by teachers and always really looked up to teachers. Um, and so I've kind of tried to surround my my team of my managers and my lawyer and my A and R at my label and the other producers that I've worked with and and songwriters. I really have have sought people that feel like mentors um, and feel like almost like my graduate thesis advisors. Yeah, people that I know are going to kick my ass um, if I'm slacking off. Um, and people that I, I feel really excited to go to because of their resumes and just all that they have learned and, and how willing they are to share. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it, too, though. Like they were like a graduate degree 
These are the people that have already mm-hmm. kind of accomplished where you want to be. So you're going to try to soak up as much information as you can from them. Sure. Well, because, you know, like signing a record deal in a lot of ways feels like you've made it. Right. But that is so far from the truth. It's like that is now you you have like step one or <laughs> now you are like on the path. Um, so when I was when I was talking to labels, I I really wanted to make the decision of who am I going to grow with? Like, who can I who am I going to because I feel that I can learn from them, mm-hmm. not just like, hey, I signed a record deal. That's that's it. Yeah, it's all it's all done. I'm set. I've had uh, conversations with people and the uh, other artists and stuff. Uh, like Anthony is the singer of the band Bayside. He was telling me, just because you signed to the label, it doesn't mean yeah, like you said, it doesn't mean you made it. It's pretty much they're giving you a seat at the table. They're 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 yeah. they're moving you from the kids' table to the big table. And now, what's what's up now? Like you kind of have to it's so now prove it's yourself. Some, <laughs> it's something I always think about with my my oldest friend. Um, I just posted this picture of. My the first gig I ever played, it was the seventh grade, sixth or seventh grade talent show. Um, oh, nice! And uh, it's my grandmother took this photo. It's so good. I posted it on my Instagram. Um, and these are the, the other people in the band are still my closest friends, and we always talk about. Um, we always say making it is making it, mm-hmm. and that's like that's the phrase that we remind ourselves that like the feeling of like I've made it is the feeling of being able to keep making things keep making music is that's it that's when you know you've made it is that you get to keep making it right you get to keep doing what you love wow i'm looking at that picture right now that's pretty crazy (laughs) pretty wild right two bass guitars two bass guitars two guitars one drummer um (laughs) and you can see the crowd was going nuts oh yeah absolutely (laughs) it's so good it looks just like every (laughs) Like multi-purpose room in every elementary school in the whole oh, yeah. world. <laughs> like, oh, it's so yeah. good how they're all the same. Uh, that's awesome. Everybody's just sitting down. It was great. So that was your first performance. I I want to learn about that was how, the first show. Yeah, how did you form this band? Like, what was the first instrument you learned how to play? Bass. I started on bass. Okay. Um, my my friend Peter Brownlee, who's who's on. I'm on the far left in that photo, and he's the one right next to me. Okay, um, you got the the hat and the red unbuttoned shirt on, the red bass. That's right. Like. That's okay, right. cool. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the red Fender Squire P bass. Nice. Um, and he Pete moved to town. He was like the new kid in school, and he was like, "I'm getting a Fender electric P bass." And I was like, "Guess what? Me too," because <laughs> uh, I didn't want to be outdone by him, okay. the new cool kid in school. Sure. Uh, and that's how it started. And then we just like, I mean, I remember printing off reams of tabs from like ultimate guitar and websites like that oh yeah i remember um, i had played oh yeah uh i had played piano before that my grandmother um had gotten me in piano lessons and she used to sing to me when i was a baby and so i always i took to music really quickly Mm -hmm. but then after that it was like once i learned bass then it was playing along to cds and i would always go with my dad to the bookstore when he was picking up books for that he was teaching for his class. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would just immediately sprint to the CD section at Borders and um, get Pink Floyd records and ACDC records and Beatles records and then go home and just like play along to them in my bedroom. Rad. So you just go home and print the tabs out and then just try to follow along? Print the tabs out and, and also just like learning by ear. Um, it was such good ear training of just like kind of learning instincts of, of this is how you play with other people, especially as a bass player. This is, this is what you do when your bandmate is Angus Young. This is what you do when your, <laughs> your bandmate is John Lennon. Like as a bass player, that was such good training in how to just be a bass player. Cause for, for I, I find that most, most bass players are the guy who just wasn't as good at guitar. <laughs> right, um, yeah. Who, the guy they got, weaseled like, into playing bass. Playing bass. <laughs> yeah. It was like, well, you're not as good, so we need a bass player. So we're going to take two of your strings away, and now you're a bass player. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's, it was for me, like actually really learning how to be a bass player um, was really important. And I miss that. Uh, like, I really miss that as, as much as I love um, 
just being a, a solo artist now, the years I spent touring in other people's bands as just a hired gun bass player mm-hmm. um, were so satisfying. Yeah. So you were able to, to tour and stuff just with other bands as a, as a bass player? Yeah, I toured for a while. In, in, in college, um, I was in a band and after school, we all moved into a house together and I was booking us tours up and down the East Coast. Wow. Um, and just like just cold calling people, really hustling hard. Yeah, just cold calling people. I would, I would always. Um, my secret was I would poach from other people's tours. So like friends on Facebook um, or bands that I looked up to that were like just a little bit ahead of us would post their list of tour dates, and then I would call. I would just that's like a perfect free list of venues to call. And <laughs> yeah. say, okay, well these people are just ahead of us. So I would just call their entire, like all of their, uh, the venues that they were playing and say, oh yeah, my friends, whether they were friends or not, just played a show. Um, and they reached out about getting in touch. So I, yeah, hustled really hard. We, we played, we did a couple of long runs up and down the East coast, down through like, we were living in Massachusetts, down through like North Carolina, Virginia, um, South Carolina. It was a blast. Um, did that for a while and then that band fell apart Mm -hmm. and that's when I totally quit and got this apprenticeship with this potter in, in Western Massachusetts. And I was there for like, it was supposed to be a three year program with him apprenticeship program. And after like a year and a half, he very lovingly kicked me out and was like, you just, you have to go play music again. You're going to go crazy if you don't do it. So he, he pushed me out. Um, and he's still one of my closest mentors. Um, and I got hired by um, this artist named Caroline Rose. Um, and I toured with her and started in the, between off days um, or between tours on off days. I was working on my own songs and writing in hotel rooms and um, sending the songs around. And when I was on tour in Switzerland, I got a call from my dream managers saying that they wanted to work together. So I flew back from that tour and left the band a couple weeks later and moved out to LA. Wow. Wow. So before, like when you were in the touring band, um, where you weren't writing the songs, you were just playing bass with them. Nope. I was just, I was just playing bass. Yeah. For Caroline stuff. Um, she's such an amazing bass player herself um, and played play based on her record. Um, so I was just, I mean, like, what a joy to be hired to play someone else's badass bass lines. Um, that was such a thrill. Um, and it was such a good education and watching her both as a front person and a band leader and a songwriter and seeing how she conducted herself in interviews and how she conveyed, you know, her uh, brain, her musical brain to people, both on stage and on recordings and in interviews that was like a graduate education for me in being a musician Mm -hmm. yeah you're able to learn a lot from her just yeah that's absolutely yeah wow so then you moved to la you got a call so you were Mm -hmm. in you said switzerland and you get a call i was in switzerland yeah i get a call in switzerland the people that you are you you know you've been dreamed to be managed by yeah and then right away you're like okay i gotta get back to la and then what was the next thing that happened from there so at that point, I, I didn't, I wasn't living anywhere because I'd been on tour for a year and a half with Caroline. Um, oh, wow. So that I was just like, yeah, living out of a suitcase on the road. Um, we had like another week and a half or two weeks of, of touring throughout Europe. Um, so I played the rest of those shows. And then when we got back, um, I went straight to the New York and met up with the managers and we kind of hatched out a plan and, so I, I gave Caroline my six weeks notice um, yeah. and then decided to just drive out to L.A. Um, and didn't really know anyone other than my manager um, and uh, just kind of jumped right in and was living over a guitar store um, and doing a bunch of writing sessions with people and one thing led to another and six months later signed a record deal, which still feels dizzying and impossible. Um, but it all came together really quickly. Yeah. That's amazing. And now you have a, an EP coming out. The EP comes out Friday, which, which is 
been a long time coming. How excited are you for that to come out? I'm stoked. Um, it's all kind of bizarre, you know, releasing music in, in quarantine. Um, <laughs> yeah, totally. I wish I was playing a release show and things like that, but, uh, more than anything else, I'm, I'm just happy to be contributing to, uh, the world. I consume so much music. It's like, I, I want to balance it out and contribute music, uh, also. Um, and then, you know, you put out this and then I get to start, uh, start releasing more music after that for the next EP. Yeah. Tell me about uh, Human Now, though. The, were those songs that you had, like, structures to prior to moving to L.A. from from that, from that getting that phone call, or did you just start from scratch right when you got to Los Angeles? Um, they were... Two of them are, are older songs. Um, the first two songs that I released, Bad Night and Happy Birthday, You're Alone, um, I had written both of those, like, while on tour with Caroline Rose. Um and those were those were the songs that I was like I was sending around to people, and those are the ones that that um, fell into the hands of this this lawyer who's now my lawyer. She was the one who connected me with the managers. Um, so they really like by a stroke of luck uh, just fell into the right hands. Wow! But then the rest of the songs were um, were all new ones that I wrote out here when I. When I signed um, with Warner Records, um, my A and R, um, we sat down, and I was feeling pretty, pretty cool because I had like 15 songs done. Mm. Um, I was feeling pretty heroic, and he was <laughs> like, "Yeah, that's great. I need you to write 50 songs." Um, and wow. I yeah immediately got back to work and ended up writing closer to like 75. Um, and then we, you know, you pick 10. Wow. And how long of a period was that? Like to write 75 songs? That was like four months or so. Jeez, that um, sounds like a lot of songs. It was a lot of, it was a lot of writing, but that, you know, it was good. It was such a humbling experience because we all, I think, tend to feel pretty damn accomplished when you have like one song done and to feel really precious about that, like, this is going to be the song. Mm -hmm. Um, and the truth of it is, is like, you just have to keep writing. Um, and you gotta, you gotta keep going and you gotta push through even when it feels like you've got nothing to write about. Um, some, some really interesting songs. I don't know if they were my best songs, but I learned a lot from them. Uh, the songs that I, when I felt like I don't really have anything to say right now, mm -hmm. you kind of dig into like a deeper subconscious brain space. Sure. And out of those 75 songs, was it hard to narrow down the, the you know, five or 10 that you guys chose? No, no, definitely not. A lot of them sucked. Um, <laughs> a lot of them were really bad. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was pretty clear which ones, um, were the good ones, but, but there are a lot of them that I look back on and go and think about like, Oh, there's, there's something really interesting in there. And I love, there's a Tom Waits quote about songwriting where he says that some songs are, are meant to be cut up and used as bait to catch other songs. Uh, and I think that's such a beautiful image. Yeah. And I think about it all the time of, of not being too precious with a song and, and thinking, well, maybe this bridge idea, if I just kind of surgically remove that, um, maybe I'll catch a different song from that. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, take, take elements and pieces or lyrics from mm -hmm. some, some of those 65 songs that you didn't use and could create something else. Exactly. Wow. So, um, have you been able to, you know, perform any of these songs live or has it all kind of been a process under this quarantine that we've been doing? Uh, a little bit of both. Yeah. Before, um, let's see, before I like went into the, went into the studio with like the kind of final 10 songs that are, that are broke spread out over these two EPs. Um, I had played a handful of shows with a really great um, band that I put together out here, some amazing players. And that, I love that process because that's like uh, the whole new reimagining of, of the songs. And you learn so much more from them when you have to kind of spread them out over a, a couple of different players. Mm -hmm. um, because I pretty much, it was me and Tommy English. Um, we played everything on, on um, the recordings. So for the newest songs, um, the three others other than 
Happy Birthday and Bad Night. I haven't played those live other than just playing them acoustic by myself. Um, I opened for, for Ethan Gruska um, the last show. It was like a week and a half before the lockdown orders went into place. Oh, place. really? I opened for him. Cool. Yeah, it was an amazing, an amazing show. Um, I opened for him and uh, played a couple of these songs for the first time, just solo acoustic. Uh, How did it feel? It felt great. It's it's fun to have to relearn them, and um, I'm I'm not too um, I don't care about like re-editing a song when you're playing it live. Um, so I'll hack it up and feel that okay, this bridge isn't working when it's just me playing acoustic. So I'm going to leave that out. And the songs are always growing, and and um, I never want to get so precious with them that they can't take on new forms of themselves yeah i think they have to keep moving sure yeah well joshua we're super excited for for human now coming out on friday i know it's thank you it's gonna be amazing for you and i appreciate your time and, and you chatting with me i want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists advice for aspiring artists yes um i found that no one wanted to do anything for me until they saw that i could do it myself so booking shows, um, putting together a band, making music videos, um, just as much as you can do it yourself. Um, and in the process, I think you'll, you'll develop your artistic vision in ways that you didn't quite realize. You'll start figuring out how you want to present yourself as a visual artist, as well as an, an artist on, on record. Um, that, is, that was advice that was given to me. Um, early on and, and served me really well.